Morning, everybody. Jeremy Bernanski here with Bernanski's Vlog. It's 10 a.m. It's Monday morning. It's time for another brand new episode of Bernanski's Vlog live right here on YouTube. Now, we are going to jump into a couple news stories. We've got two movie reviews, Certified Rad, What's Hitting Theaters, What's Arriving on DVD and Blu-ray. Plus, we've got another interview I'm going to recommend you guys check out if you have the time. But before we do all of that and before we jump into this week's brand new episode... Let's take a minute. Let's check the YouTube board. Make sure we've got a clean stream. Got that green light going. All right, we're going to be right back. We're going to roll the intro, and then we will get right into this week's brand new episode of Bernanski's Vlog. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with you. Good morning, everybody. I'm Jeremy Bernanski. This is Bernanski's vlog live on YouTube. That means it's Monday morning. It's 10 a.m. PSD. Thanks so much for joining me again for another episode. Season three, episode 25. We're coming to you right now. So before we jump into what's happening this week, let's get the commercials out of the way. So if you have not yet clicked subscribe for this channel, go ahead and do that. Then hit the bell so you get the notifications when new content drops right here on this channel. Every Monday morning, 10 a.m. PST, we have a brand new episode. So make sure you click subscribe so you don't miss out. Also, if you haven't, go ahead and give me the thumbs up at any point during this show because the thumbs up helps people who like movie-related shows find this movie-related show right here on YouTube. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Bernanski's Vlog. That's where we do all the updates and also the Stardust app. Stardust is where I do all my movie trailer reviews. So you're going to want to go ahead and follow us there. You can download that from any of the app stores, Stardust, and then make sure you check me out, Bernanski's Vlog. We got over 200 movie trailer reviews up there. So check it out. Also, if you have any interest in doing your own YouTube show or your own live stream on you know any of the platforms, Facebook Live, Twitch, YouTube, I have some recommendations down in the description box below for just items I think that you might want to check out to start your own YouTube channel. Again, just general entry level stuff to get you started, get your foot in the door and get your content online for people to see and for you to share. So check those out. Also, down below in the description box, all of the articles we'll be talking about for the news stories are all going to be down there as well. So as we go through the stories, if you want to follow along with the actual article we're looking at, those are going to be down there and available. Again, just click the little box, drop it down, and you can check out all of those articles. All right. We're going to go ahead and jump into this week's show. We got a lot to talk about. We got some pretty cool news stories. We're going to take a look at two movie reviews. I got out to see The House with a Clock in Its Walls as well as Peppermint. So we're going to take a look at those two movies later in the show. Also, we're going to take a look at the weekend box office report. What did you guys see? What was everybody out watching this weekend? Then we'll take a look at what's hitting theaters this week, what's arriving on DVD and Blu-ray this week for your home theater, and finally my personal favorite segment, Certified Rad. So let's go ahead and jump right now into the movie news segment. Boom, there it is. All right, so down below you can see we got the ticker tape running. That's going to be some honorable mentions. If you're new to the show, honorable mentions are new stories that pop off that I thought were cool, but we didn't have enough time to talk about on this week's show. So keep your eyes peeled down below in the ticker tape running news stories as well as in the description box and right here on the channel. So let's jump into the weekend box office report. Now, I said at the top of the show, I got out to see two films. Again, House of the Clock and Its Walls, Peppermint, enjoyed both of them for different reasons. Again, you'll hear why after the news segment when those reviews drop. Uh, but let's take a look and see what you guys got out to see this weekend in theaters. So coming in at number five, we have Crazy Rich Asians at 6,515,000. Then we have The Predator at 8,700,000. The Nun at 10,250,000. A Simple Favor at 10,400,000. And The House with a Clock in Its Walls coming in at number one in its opening weekend at $26,850,000. So there you go. Number one, House with a Clock in Its Walls. Now, Eli Roth directed this. And for those of you who uh, are Eli Roth fans, it probably surprised you to find out that uh, the guy who is known for his very uh, horror movie style 
decided to do like a family horror movie, a magic movie, if you will. It's not really horror. It's more like magic, magic fantasy. So he did a really good job with the film. I really enjoyed it. Uh, you'll hear my thoughts in a little bit as to what I particularly found enjoyable throughout the story, throughout the film. Uh, it's really well done, um, and you'll hear why. So job well done to Eli Roth and team for House of the Clock and its Walls. Again, really, really fun movie. I did not expect to enjoy it as much as I did. Uh, and yeah, I might go see it again. It was a lot of fun. A simple favor. My review for that is up on the channel right now. I really enjoyed that film, but I did have some issues uh, with how certain scenes in the film felt like they were ripped right out of like a comedy movie instead of what I thought this film was trying to achieve as a thriller. So you can go check my review out for that. Uh, that's up on the movie playlist on this channel. And then The Nun, didn't see that one, but it had high ranking last week too, if you guys remember from last week's show. So no surprise to see it's still in the top five. Uh, it is officially fall. It's officially autumn, right? So we're moving into scary movie season as Halloween approaches. Plus we got Oscar season approaching with all of those films coming out with the high drama and the movies that really look at the human experience, etc. So it's going to be a nice mixed bag for us as we'll find out a little bit later in the show when we look at what's hitting theaters. But hey, congratulations to everybody who went out and saw The Nun. Uh, you guys are really helping your genre out uh, and keeping that franchise alive. Coming in number four, The Predator. Uh, I saw that movie. It was okay, right? It surprised me. It definitely wasn't The Predator movie I thought I was going to get. Um, it had some high points. It had some low points. My review for that is up on the channel. You can check it out. I am surprised to see it in the top five. Um, I thought it would be in the top 10, uh, you know, because it's not that old. It hasn't been out that long. It's only in its second week. But yeah, for the top five, I am surprised that that many people went back and saw it again. Um, so that speaks to the fan base, either of Shane Black and the people who like his movies. I like his movies, but I, I don't see myself going back to see The Predator anytime soon. So Congratulations to everybody with uh, that was involved in the Predator staying in the top five for the second week. Uh, like I said, I am surprised to see it in the top five, definitely in the top 10, but the top five surprises me. Um, Crazy Rich Asians, no surprise there. I really, really like this movie a lot. Uh, that review also is up on the channel. You can check it out. I just thought that was an A plus movie story. The way everything looked, the characters, they just knocked it out of the park. Grand slam for that one. No surprise to see that's in the top five. Check out my review for more information there. Let's just real quick round out the top 10. We've got Searching, The Meg at number nine, Fahrenheit 11.9 at number eight, Peppermint at number seven, White Boy Rick at number six. So out of those, um, surprised to see that Life Itself did not make it into the top 10. Uh, opening weekend, really big cast, all-star cast, really. And that came in at number 11, uh, making just over $2 million. Really surprising, but if you remember last week's show, I said the trailers didn't really give you a lot, right? You just kind of saw it and you're like, oh, this hints at things. It gives you clues to things, but it doesn't really tell you kind of what this movie is going to be about. It's kind of ambiguous in tone uh, in delivery. So kind of surprised to see it didn't come in in the number 10 with the cast it had, but maybe the film just wasn't that good. I don't know. I haven't checked the cinema score on it. I haven't checked the Rotten Tomatoes score on it. Uh, and I haven't really been seeing any press about it, um, positive or negative. So surprised at life itself coming in out of the top 10 in its opening week. And Fahrenheit 11.9, uh, not really surprised that it did so poorly uh, at all. Um, especially with the current climate that we're living in politically. We're not going to get into that because this is not a politics show. This is a movie show. Um, so, yeah, surprised that that did as poorly. Not surprised that it did as poorly as it did. I am surprised that it's in the top 10, though. So there you go. The top 10. Searching, The Meg, Fahrenheit, 11.9, Peppermint, White Boy, Rick, Crazy Rich Asians, The Predator, The Nun, The Nun, A Simple Favor, and The House with a Clock and Its Walls. So there you go. Check out my reviews in the movie review playlist for more information on those films that I have seen and reviewed on this channel. And also go ahead and leave your thoughts in the comment section below and get that conversation started. What did you think about those films? If you saw them in theaters, what did you get out to see this weekend? Let us know in the comments below. All right. First news story of the day is coming to us from The Hollywood Reporter. And this is Kingsman 3. Kingsman 3 is official. That is happening. And it has landed a fall of 2019. Release date Matthew Vaughn coming back to round out the franchise to make this a trilogy. He is going to be writing and directing. Color me excited, people. Color me excited. I really enjoy the Kingsman franchise. First one, I really liked. Second one, I was like, this is good. It had some interesting decisions in it, to say the least. Um, 
probably the most memorable part in that film for me was Mark Strong singing um, Country Road by John Denver, right? As he's just blowing stuff up at the end of the film. So really like that. I'm not sure if he's going to be returning. They brought the, they've brought other characters back from the dead, right? So no big, no big surprise there. Uh, in the article, it talks about how this is going to be the conclusion of the Harry Hart and Eggsy relationship, which has me interested to see kind of where that goes. Because if you saw the last one, you know that, you know, the Kingsmen, they have to kind of regroup and redo everything with their American partners and everything like that. So curious to see if that means that we're going to see Harry kind of taking things over. Uh, or sorry, Eggsy, if Eggsy is going to be taking things over, uh, if Harry actually does depart uh, officially, right, forever this time, not just as like a fake out. But can't wait to see this. Really like the first two movies. Again, the second one was uh, it had some weird stuff in it, right, because they ground human beings into like hamburger patties. <sighs> that was weird. So, you know, who knows what's going to happen in this third one, but I'm looking forward to it. I'm excited about it. This is going to be a fun trilogy, I think, for like spy action franchises. It's already been two fun spy films, two spy adventure action films, right? So looking forward to seeing what Matthew Vaughn brings to round out and close out the trilogy. If it's just going to end at three with his involvement, who knows? Uh, but definitely excited to see him kind of put the final touches on this trilogy and yeah, let me know what you think. Did you like the first one? Did you like the second one? Hit that comments box. Let us know. All right. Next up, big news coming because we got the paparazzi, right? We got we got pocket paparazzis. If you've got a cell phone and you've got a camera on that cell phone, which I'm assuming you do, you are basically the paparazzi. So we got pocket paparazzis, actual paparazzis. Everybody is taking photos that's working on the new Joker movie with Joaquin Phoenix. They're taking photos, they're posting it online. So the director steps up to the plate and he goes, you know what? I'm not going to let you guys ruin my movie with your like weird, way far back, you know, snapshots and everything like that of my movie. So he just took to the internet and he posted some of his own photos. He posted a video, right? Uh, so this article is coming to us from Variety and Todd Phillips, uh, he went ahead and on his Instagram, he threw up that screening, right? Where it shows Joaquin Phoenix standing there. And then you got that light that keeps passing over his face until eventually like it hits him and it's like a Joker overlay on top of him. So it just shows you kind of what that is. And then also we got the actual photos of him in that subway in the full Joker uh, garb and makeup. Right. Well, how early into the movie is that? How late in the movie is that? We don't know. Is that the first Joker look that he has before he adjusts it to what we know and are more familiar with where he doesn't look like an actual circus clown makeup? We don't know. All we know is these photos look pretty dope. Um, I was pretty excited by these. Uh, I'm looking forward to the film. It's a standalone. It's outside of the DC universe, right? The DC extended universe, the film cinematic universe, whatever you want to call it. It's outside of that. It's a separate Elseworld tale. Um, and I'm with it. I think it looks pretty dope. I think it's going to be pretty bomb. I hope. I hope it, you know, it hits that expectation. I think it's going to exceed the expectation if I'm being honest. Um, but just from this early stuff, I'm really liking it. I'm looking forward to hearing the laugh because, uh, you know, the Joker laugh. That's one of the things. Right. So looking forward to hearing Joaquin Phoenix's version of the Joker laugh. That maniacal gets inside of your bones and just chills you to the core laugh. I can't wait to hear that. Uh, and then just kind of figuring out what the story is going to be about, how Robert De Niro's character is going to play into this. What's going on with Zazie Beats? What's going on with Mark Maron's character? There's a lot we still have to wait for, but. Early stuff that Todd Phillips is releasing to counteract all that paparazzi stuff looks pretty good. So I'm excited. Hope you're excited. Hit that comments box. Check out the article. It's got the video in it. And let me know your thoughts. Are you excited after seeing this video and those photos? New Joker movie. Let us know. All right. Last article of the day for the news is coming to us from Empire. Joseph Gordon-Levitt and Jamie Foxx are coming together to make and star in a sci-fi thriller. That's right, a sci-fi thriller. Um, he is going to be starring as uh, in Portland. He's going to be a futuristic cop, so it takes place in the future. And he is going to be trying to get uh, an addictive drug off the streets of Portland. And this particular narcotic grants the user superpowers. And in the article, it also talks about how the, he discovers that the only way he's going to stop the bad guys is to take the narcotic to become a super powered superhero to stop him. Right. So pretty, pretty poetic stuff. Right. You have to become the monster that you're trying. You have to become the monster 
that they've created to stop the monster they've created. Kind of kind of poetic, right? So I don't know if I explained that right, but it makes sense in my head. So I think this could be really cool, right? So he's trying to get all these drugs off the streets. He realizes this is an insurmountable task, but if he takes the drug, he can actually get the power to get all of the bad guys off the street. So he has to take, you know, what they're selling, what he's trying to stop before he can stop them. Pretty poetic stuff. I hope that one made more. I hope that explanation made more sense. So I'm looking forward to this. I think this could be really good. Both Joseph Gordon-Levitt and Jamie Foxx, very talented actors. When they really commit to a role, they can really bring the sauce. So curious to see kind of what happens there. Hopefully Jamie Foxx gives us a, a more kind of realistic performance as far as what his character is going to be more than what we got from baby driver. I thought his character in baby driver was a little bit more cheese. I thought he kind of hammed it up a little bit and maybe a little over the top, more caricature than character. So hopefully he's able to reel it back and just really deliver like strong performances. Like I've seen him do before in other films. Um, Joseph Gordon Levitt, always knocking it out of the park. Really like that guy's style. I think he's a very talented actor and I'd like to see him in more movies. So I'm happy to see that he's coming back for this. And they also mentioned the film Looper in this article too, which if you haven't seen, definitely recommend it. Looper is a really good sci-fi movie. Um, and I definitely recommend people check that out. That, that one surprised me. It's a lower budget sci-fi movie that really, really over delivers on just quality content, story and character. So check out Looper as well. So looking forward to this. Uh, it's the film was at one point called Power. Um, and again, Joseph Gordon-Levitt plays a cop who has to get a dangerous, addictive drug off the streets of Portland. So sci-fi tale about uh, drugs and crime thrillers. Sounds good to me, right? Sounds good to me. Let me know what you guys think. we got a lot of talented people involved in this. Check out the article for more information. But I'm excited. Hope you guys are excited. Let me know what is your favorite performance by Joseph Gordon-Levitt and Jamie Foxx. Let us know in the comments below. All right, everybody, that wraps it up for the news. Uh, before we jump off into the movie reviews, I did want to recommend you guys check out in the, in the description box below, there's an article that the Hollywood Reporter did with Bob Iger. Uh, he came out talking about what's going on with Disney, what happened with Star Wars, with Solo, and how it underperformed. Um, you'll hear later in the show, Solo's getting ready to come out on DVD and Blu-ray, so pretty, pretty well-timed article or interview uh, to be released that coincides with the release of the physical media for Solo, right? Because you can digitally download it, but now we can actually get the physical media, which this guy's a fan of. Hope you're a fan of physical media as well. Um, you should be. You should be. All right. So check out that article down below. He talks about Disney and how there's going to be booze in Disneyland. Um, and then he says, you know, in the article, in the interview, he even says like, you know, he thinks Disney used to go home and have a drink. So what I did is he's correct. And what I did is I threw the article, the interview that Walt Disney did where he talks about it, which I referenced before on this show, right underneath that interview with Bob Iger from The Hollywood Reporter, where you can see that Walt Disney himself in the interview says that he doesn't want booze in the park. But yes, even after a long day, he himself likes to go home and relax with a glass of whatever he was drinking. Right. So Bob Iger nails it on the head. Disney did like to have a drink or two. And you can check out both of those interviews. They are down below in the show notes. Check them out. We're going to go ahead and move now into the movie review segment. Like I said, I got out to see two films this past week, House with a Clock in Its Walls and Peppermint. Stay tuned for both of those reviews. They're coming up right now. And then right after that, don't go anywhere. We'll be right back because we are going to talk about what's hitting theaters this week, what's arriving on DVD and Blu-ray for your home theater this week in my personal favorite segment, certified rad so don't go anywhere we'll be right back enjoy these movie reviews see you in a minute warlocks witches pumpkins and creepy puppets are all part of an individual mystery surrounding one house from within the walls there comes a tick tock counting down to an apocalyptic event one warlock his neighbor and his nephew are on the hunt to try and solve the mystery of the ticking clock before they find out what tragedy awaits them if the clock counts all the way down. So, does the house with the clock in its walls deliver on the spooky, magical adventure hinted at in the trailers? Or does this film only cast a sleeping spell on the audience? Let's talk about it in this review. The plot of the story takes one or two surprisingly enjoyable twists and turns that I wasn't expecting. The basic plot is a warlock casts a spell on a house, and because of that spell, a tick-tock comes from within the walls as a clock begins a countdown to an apocalyptic event. 
Upon casting the spell, once the spell is completed, the warlock himself is killed, and a key magically appears that is made out of bone. Pretty spooky stuff so far, let's keep going. His friend Jonathan, played by Jack Black, who is also a warlock, takes over the house and then begins to search and hunt and find the reason for this tick-tock inside the walls and to try and stop it from whatever apocalyptic event awaits them. So within this basic plot synopsis, there is plenty to work with for a story. But this film does a great job of diving even deeper into these characters and the magic. The characters all play off of each other nicely and I was incredibly surprised at how quickly I bought into the on-screen chemistry between Jack Black and Kate Blanchett. There is surprising depth to her character for a movie that feels like it's going to enjoy a nice long run every Halloween on ABC Family. She has some pretty major baggage in this film that really limits her mystical abilities, but by the end of the film, we see her come to terms with things and she finds renewed strength and purpose. Plus, seeing her shoot magical bolts of energy from an umbrella was pretty cool. Jonathan's nephew, Lewis, played by Owen Vaccara, delivers a quirky book nerd with a high IQ and a lot of heart very well. His parents are killed in an accident and because of that, he's sent to live with his uncle. So while he's there living with his uncle Jonathan, he decides to learn magic from him and Florence. Adding to his story, he also has difficulty making friends and relating to the boys at school because his interests are so very different than the interests of all the other boys in his classes and on the playground. And if things weren't bad enough for this young man already, he is having visions of his dead mother every night speaking to him. This kid just can't catch a break. And to make matters worse, the big plot twist, the big reveal of what is happening with his dead mother was by far for me the most evil aspect of this film. For a movie that deals with sorcery, creepy puppets, necromancy, and schoolyard bullies, it's the discovery and the big reveal that it's not hallucinations, but actually a cruel manipulation trick being played on him with regards to his dead mother that really added a big wow factor for me in the theater. The House with the Clock in Its Walls is playing at your local movie theater right now, and I really enjoyed my time in this story with these characters. It's a well-told magical fantasy adventure story that really digs into the personalities of each character, their personal struggles, the steps it takes to solve a mystical mystery, trying to prevent the end of the world, battling creepy puppets, angry pumpkins, an evil warlock, and more. Plus, on top of all of this, there are some really well-timed comedic moments to round out this whole story and create a three-dimensional world. However, since I can't recommend this film to my nieces and nephews because of one scene in the movie that deals with the actual devil, this film cannot get all the high fives from this guy. So, A House with a Clock in Its Walls will be getting both high fives instead. The House with a Clock in Its Walls is playing at your local movie theater right now. Check it out. Mexican drug dealers and money launderers, crooked cops, shifty lawyers, corrupt judges, murder, a family is lost, plotting, revenge, street level gritty violence and souls as dark as the clothes worn by this anti-hero. No, I'm not talking about the Punisher, even though the similarities in this story are uncanny. So does Peppermint deliver on the intensity and action hinted at in the trailers or should we enjoy some spearmint instead? Either way, we've got fresh breath. All right, let's get into this review. Jennifer Garner is back in the action leading lady role, delivering a performance that far exceeds what we got from her as Electra. She brings believable hurt and determination similar to what we get from Keanu Reeves in the John Wick franchise. It's clear that she decided to really deep dive into this character, deliver an action movie performance that I was not expecting at all and was pleasantly surprised by. She could easily spin this movie into a brand new action franchise. However, in this particular story, I was very disappointed at times at the lack of creativity used to tell the story and to build her character. The story in this film, almost beat for beat, felt incredibly similar to Marvel's The Punisher. But again, setting that aside and just looking at her performance, Jennifer Garner does deliver a pretty entertaining action movie performance. So in The Punisher, Frank Castle's family is killed by the mob. He, a war veteran, exacts revenge on them by using his skills in combat. Here, Riley North is just your average working class wife and mother. 
She sees her family gunned down one evening and then after the trial is over, she disappears because she actually goes out throughout the world, across the globe, to learn how to fight and use guns. Then on the five year anniversary of her husband and her daughter's death, she comes back into town to exact revenge on the guys that killed her family, as well as everybody that was involved on getting them released from the trial so that they could go back out into the street and kill some more. Oh, also, Riley and the Punisher both have vans that they keep their gear in. So you can kind of start to see how the similarities are really stacking up between these two stories. Overall, despite the similarities between the Punisher and this story, I thought the action scenes did look pretty good. And truth be told in this story, I could have used more explosives or grenades to kind of balance out some of the action so it wasn't just guns, fists, and knives. If Riley can find and steal assault rifles, steal some grenades too, lady. I'm just saying, blow some stuff up. I'm not saying we need super slow-mo spin shots of her lobbing grenades into buildings or cars, making this feel like a Michael Bay movie. But I am saying that every now and again, a good kaboom is kind of fun, and it really pumps up the action and the enjoyment factor for me personally in these types of films. It's an action movie, so go ahead and celebrate that and take that action up a notch. The additional characters in this film all added to the world that this story takes place in as well. And what I really appreciated about this story is how we don't waste any time getting to know these characters who may or may not be on screen for that long. We get enough of their story to understand who they are, their motivations, what part they serve in this story, and that was fine for me. That was actually a highlight. I don't necessarily always care to know why bad guys do bad things in these stories when it's a woman on a mission tale. Give me the woman on a mission tale, and I'm happy to report this film did exactly that. Peppermint is playing at your local movie theater right now, and if you enjoy action movies that move at the speed of action movies, you'll probably enjoy this one. The action scenes in this movie all look pretty great, and again, all of the characters in it, you understand why they're doing what they're doing and kind of how it all fits together into the story to build out this world that again, could lead into an action movie franchise. There are some plot holes in this story because it's not a perfect movie, and again, it does feel very, very similar to The Punisher. But Jennifer Garner delivers a really great action performance that, again, could easily spin this into an action movie franchise. So because of that, Peppermint is getting at least one high five from this guy. Peppermint is playing at your local movie theater right now. Check it out. All right, and we're back. Let me make sure that's on. There we go. Okay, we're back, and we're going to round out this show. We're going to take a look at what is hitting theaters this week, what is arriving on DVD and Blu-ray for your home theater this week, and finally, my personal favorite segment, Certified Rad. So if you're still with us, thank you so much for joining us. We're going to go ahead and jump right now into what's hitting theaters this week. All right, in theaters this week, we have Little Women, Hellfest, Smallfoot, and Night School. So out of these four films, the one I'm looking forward to is Smallfoot. Uh, the cast in it has uh, got some pretty good voice talent in there. I've enjoyed the trailers that I have seen so far for this. It looks gonna, like it's going to be just a goofy, fun, uh, kind of animated family film. So looking forward to that. Uh, might get out to see that uh, this weekend, hopefully. Uh, but as far as Little Women, Hellfest, and Night School go... Um, I might check out Night School, uh, Hellfest, I don't know anything about. When I pulled up all the info for that, I was like, I'd never even heard of this movie. So I'm not too sure what's going on there with that. And then Little Women, a remake of, you know, the Little Women's story from what I'm assuming. I uh, haven't really heard too much on that. I haven't even seen a trailer for Little Women or Hellfest. So we'll have to wait and see kind of what's going on there with those two films. But looking forward to Smallfoot, might see Night School. Let's take a look at what's hit in DVD this week. On DVD, we have Uncle Drew and Solo and Gotti. So out of these three films, I did see Solo and Gotti. Both of my reviews for those films are up on the channel right now. You can check them out in the movie review playlist. Out of these three films, looking forward to Solo for sure. Definitely recommend you guys check that out if you missed it in theaters. Definitely a good time. Um, it did underperform it. Uh, the story, I thought Ron Howard, when he came in, uh, there was a lot of controversy on this film as far as the director's. Uh, being let go and having to reshoot most of the film and everything like that. Ron Howard stepped up in the 11th hour to deliver what I thought we, what we got from what he did, I thought was pretty good. Um, there's definitely some issues in the film. Uh, for me personally, I enjoyed it. Uh, it. It didn't wow me. I wasn't walking out of the theater singing the praises of solo, but I did enjoy it. I thought Ron Howard did a really great job 
uh, piecing this story together with all the reshoots and everything else they had to do for it. Um, I thought the final product with all of the turmoil that led up to the film was pretty good. So check out Solo. Uh, definitely looking forward to uh, the bonus features on that Blu-ray disc. Hopefully we can get some commentary. I don't know what the bonus features are going to be. Um, looking forward to that, though. Faux show. So check those three out. All right. Final segment of this week's show is Certified Rad. Now, if you're new to the channel, Certified Rad is one thing that I find someone sends me, uh, whatever. It could be a book. It could be a tech gear review. It could be a story. It could be whatever, right? If I find it, if someone sends it to me, I look it over. If I say, yeah, that's pretty rad, we're going to certify it rad right here on this channel every week. So this week for Certified Rad, we have an article coming to us from abc30.com so abc news um, abc30 action news.com is bringing us this story this morning so we have covered inspirational stories about people really banding together to try and help those in need especially when it comes to hurricanes right because we had the hurricane in texas that was super bad and now we got the hurricane hitting the east coast uh, hurricane florence which is super bad uh, hitting the Carolinas. Not a good time over there. Not a good time at all, for sure. Mother Nature is on a rampage. So we have this inspiring story uh, coming to us from ABC Action New ABC 30 Action News. And it is Chick-fil-A opens its doors and hearts to help North Carolina evacuees during Hurricane Florence. So what happened is, uh, if you know Chick-fil-A, you know that Chick-fil-A is not open on Sundays, right? That's uh, They choose to not be open, uh, and they choose to kind of recognize that day as a day off. So no Chick-fil-A's are open on Sundays. Don't bother showing up. The doors are locked. The lights are off. Go somewhere else. That's the Sunday routine for Chick-fil-A. So this uh, story, they actually decided to open up a Chick-fil-A on a Sunday because they wanted to help out the people that were emergency evac out of the area because of Hurricane Florence. So uh, Donovan and Nikki Carlos had been watching the storm unfold on television. This is right from the article. And like so many others, they kept asking themselves one question. What can we do to help? So the restaurant owners who owned uh, or franchising out of Chick-fil-A, own the Chick-fil-A, they decided they're going to get their team together, find out who's available, get them to come in on a Sunday and kind of get together, start whipping up some food and start dishing that food out to people in need. And that is exactly what they did. They coordinated with the Red Cross and they sent out 500 sandwiches and 1,200 nuggets uh, at three different shelters. So they got hot food. Hot, free, and delicious food is what it's described as in the article. They also delivered 1,200 nuggets themselves to the shelter at a former Kmart store in Garner, North Carolina. So not only did they kind of open up their store, which means they're losing money, right? Because you, they're not making money. There's nobody coming in to spend money at their store. So they're losing money by being open. So they're already sacrificing there. They're sacrificing their time. Their employees are sacrificing their day off and their time. They're not getting paid for this, right? The store is closed. So, and then they coordinate with the Red Cross to donate and get people to help them donate this food. Then they find these three different shelters, plus they themselves go and deliver to another shelter that's in an abandoned Kmart. So when you decide to really like step up to the plate and help people in need, like what we're seeing right now with Hurricane Florence, and you're willing to take that hit to try and just get people food, to be a good person, to be a good human, to use what you have to help folks that are in need, like what we're seeing here, you can guarantee that that is most definitely certified rad. So big shout out to Donovan and Nikki Carlos and all of the folks in North Carolina that work at this Chick-fil-A, as well as the Red Cross folks that help them coordinate this. This is a big step for them. Uh, in helping people. And I, I really think it's super awesome. So check that article out. It's down below. Again, that is coming to us from ABC 30 Action News. And that wraps up this week's brand new episode. I want to thank everybody so much for joining me here. If you enjoyed it again, go ahead and give me that thumbs up. Thumbs up helps people who like movie related shows find this movie related show right here on YouTube. Also, don't forget to click that subscribe button and hit the bell so you get the notifications when new content drops. Hope you guys are able to get out to the theaters this week to see 
some of the films we talked about uh, or hope you're able to get out and rent some of those films, either from a preferred streaming service or Redbox and check out all the good movies that are available on DVD and Blu-ray as well. Plenty of good content out there. Hope you guys are enjoying it. If you are, leave your comments in the comment section below. Get that conversation started and we will see you guys next Monday at 10 a.m. PST with a brand new episode of Bernanski's vlog right here on YouTube. All right, everybody, I'm going to get out of here. I'm Jeremy Bernanski. I hope you guys have a great week. And again, I hope you're able to get out to see some films with family and friends and have a good time because it's officially fall. Summer's over. So get those jackets out. Get those jeans on. Let's enjoy autumn. Let's enjoy fall. Let's get ready for winter and Christmas. And until next time, and as always, good night and good luck.